Good morning, everyone. And a very warm welcome to our worship here this morning at Mayfield Salisbury. Welcome to this joint service. Once a month we gather together uh, the half nine and the 1045 services. Uh, we come together for a joint service and I know that uh, some of our families are, are back with us this Sunday having hopefully had a very happy October week, uh, had some time off school and had a chance for a rest. Uh, so it's lovely to see you this morning and there'll be young church after the second hymn for the younger people to go out to. So welcome everyone who is here, welcome everyone who's online. And I say that every Sunday, uh, but it's not just a passing gesture, you're very welcome uh, to be part of our worship and our community as you gather online. And I know that some of those online get our congregational email, and so you have the order of service with you as you worship on a Sunday morning or during the week. But if anyone who is online would like to be more in touch with the church, then do contact us. We can keep in connection with you by email and uh, you'll have the order of service there and find out uh, about church news as we go along. So a warm welcome to everyone online too. Uh, after the service, for those who are here, do feel free as usual to come through for tea and coffee to gather together in fellowship and to chat with one another uh, through my doors to the right into the Bill McDonald Hall and do come through if you can. This morning in our worship, we will be reflecting on what's been a very uh, dramatic, very turbulent week in the life of our country, and we'll be looking for a word to, from God to speak to us in our prayers and our hymns, uh, thinking of the word too in our reflections together. Uh, before we start worship, a brief word, a brief whistle-stop tour of some uh, good things, important things that are coming up in the life of the church that you might want to be aware of or you might want to be part of. Uh, first of all, as a brief look back, you'll see uh, towards the back of the order of service at uh, number 18, a note about last week's service. Uh, last week we gathered together with the congregations of Peacefield and Craig Miller Park and had a special harvest service for Christian aid and a Christian aid lunch to follow. And you'll see um, that uh, the amazing sum of two and a half thousand pounds was raised throughout the day for Christian aid, particularly thinking of their East Africa hunger appeal. So thank you again to all those uh, who were involved in organizing, uh, particularly from our Christian aid group, but others who were involved in welcoming and in serving the lunch. Um, thank you to everyone that's been involved in fundraising and uh, congratulations and thank you indeed for the amazing sum that has been raised that um, I'm sure will make a significant difference uh, from Christian aid's East Africa appeal. Coming up at Mayfield Salisbury tonight, uh, we have our monthly small informal communion over in the south transept of the church, a chance to uh, have a more meditative and quiet and peaceful uh, gathering and we share communion together tonight. So everyone very welcome, do come along um, if you can, seven o'clock tonight here in the church. Uh, looking forward to this week, as usual, prayers in the church Tuesday at 10 o'clock. Uh, Thursday Club is on at 2 o'clock uh, on Thursday, of course, as you'll see from the order of service. You'll notice also on Thursday at number 14, we have strong connections in the church with John Ross. John Ross was a missionary in China who was the first person to translate the Bible into Korean. And uh, there's a plaque to John Ross over in the transept there. But this Thursday night, you'll notice at the, in the intimation there at number 14, there's a book launch of a new biography of John Ross. Um, and uh, an open invitation again is extended to anyone that would like to go along to the book launch to find out more about John Ross. You'll notice uh, next Saturday, number 16, is Messy Church. We're joining together with Priestfield and partnering with them in Messy Church, which is um, a chance for parents and children, grandparents and children, uh, to get involved in a more craft-based uh, type of activity and worship with food at the end, uh, four o'clock till six o'clock next Saturday at Peacefield. Um, very welcome to be there too. Next Sunday, we'll be um, back to our usual position of 9.30 and 10.45 services after the school's break, and we'll also be celebrating the sacrament of baptism at the 10.45 service of Ailey Mackay. Looking a little bit further ahead, um, you'll see at 11, the Living the Questions course is about to start from the 9th of November. And that's a way for um, if you've just been exploring faith or trying to get your head around faith and you're interested in having a discussion, a discussion group about it, you'd be very welcome. Or even if um, faith has been something in your life for many, many years, 
and you'd like to explore a bit more and refresh, uh, then please do get in touch with me and you'll be welcome on the course. I mentioned too, you'll see at uh, number three, a celebratory service coming up on the 10th of December for Bob Maiden. Bob, our good friend, uh, Pamela Molyneux's husband, passed away recently, and there'll be a service of thanksgiving and celebration for Bob's life on the 10th of December at Collington Parish Church at Bob's home church, but Pamela would like to extend an invitation to all our friends at Mayfield Salisbury. You'd be most welcome to be there on Bob's service on the 10th of December. And last week, on the 11th of December, uh, last week, uh, Walter, our choir master, mentioned the choir concert that's coming up in the evening of the 11th. You'll see that at number 12. And uh, do get in touch with Walter if you'd like to be part of an extended choir to join some of these wonderful people for our choir concert on the 11th of December and uh, put it in your diary too to come along and be part of the audience uh, if, uh, if you'd like to on the 11th of December. Uh, finally from me, uh, it's not in the order of service as the arrangements were just made at the tail end of the week uh, to bring to the congregation some sad news in the passing away of our member Mrs. Irene Scott during the week. Um, Irene was a lovely, gentle, friendly lady who suffered for many years from MS, but still had this uh, wonderfully happy personality. And she was a regular attender over many years, especially pre-COVID at the 9.30 service. Um, Irene's funeral service will be here in the church on Thursday, the 3rd of November. That's a week on Thursday at 10 a.m. And thereafter, a committal at Craig Miller Castle Park Cemetery at 11 a.m. So please do keep our husband, our daughters, and the family in your prayers this week. And thinking of our prayers, we pray, of course, in church for others, and we pray for others within our community. And that's something that's at the forefront of the prayer chain we have in church. Uh, and as part of our occasional minutes for mission, our pastoral assistant, Kay, is going to say a few words about the prayer chain. Kay. Good morning. I thought I would like to tell you um, a story about my own life um, in order to explain to you about the prayer chain. Three weeks ago, my daughter, who was due to have her first baby on the 18th of November, became very, very unwell. And she is a woman of faith, and she got in touch with me and said, Mum, I need as many people to pray for me and to pray for my baby as we can find possible to do so. And I was actually abroad at the time. I was on holiday with my husband. But I knew that Sandy was covering the prayer chain. Now, the prayer chain goes out every Monday, and it goes out to regular people who have put their names forward to receive an email on a Monday with the names and requests for people who are asking for prayer. So I text sent a text to Sandy and said, look, this baby isn't due for a while. Would you please pray for my daughter and my grandson? Then the doctors worked really hard to keep them in hospital for as long as possible, but her blood pressure just would not come down. She had preeclampsia. And lo and behold, whilst I was still on holiday, we were told that this baby was coming now. And so he was born, he was born just about three weeks ago. So he was born seven weeks premature and he was three pounds nine. Now, my daughter now has an infection in her wound, in the cesarean wound, and is back in the hospital. And it will be on the prayer chain, which will go out tomorrow. And what we need on the prayer chain, we are a huge church. We are really a huge congregation. But do you know what? We hardly have anyone on the prayer chain. And what I'm asking is, 
we have members of this congregation who come to Sandy and I and say, would you please pray for me? Or would you please pray for so-and-so? And it's confidential. If you receive the email, you don't chat to your neighbor about it. You keep it to yourself. And so many of our congregation now say, gosh, I'm getting on a bit key. I'm a bit past it. But you're not past praying. You're just not past praying. And if we are truly the voice of Christ in this community and want to carry the people in this community, then the prayer chain is looking for you. It's looking for people to make the prayer chain. I have borrowed the youth's prayer chain from last week from Hillary. But we need you. We need you to receive the email and to hold people in prayer. And that goes into the pastoral care. The pastoral care, we have at least 30 people who are visiting and phoning members of our congregation and people in the community. If you are a person who would like to join our pastoral care team, please speak to Sandy or I at the end of the service or email me or phone me. My contact details are on the order of service. Give it some thought and some prayer. And hopefully I'll hear from you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. As we begin our worship together, may the peace of Christ be with you. Will we turn to those around us and wish them the peace of Christ?
Let's say together the words of our call to worship. To feel the warmth of love, to be assured that we are cared for, to seek meaning in life, to be accepted as who we are, to be confident of our worth, to be bold to love in return. This is to know something of God. For all we know and all we might, let us worship God today.
Let's join together in prayer. Shall we pray together? Loving God, you call us to be your light in darkness, your voice in the wilderness, your hope for the hopeless. You give us strength in our weakness, peace and gentleness, words and boldness, inspiration to speak more of you and less of us, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you in this life. You poured out your life, Lord, in your Son, Jesus, that we might be filled, that we might fight the good fight and run the race with you at our side. Just as we began this race of life with you, having known each one of us since we were knitted together in our mother's womb, stay with us and take hold of our hands so that we might also cross the finish line together in due time. Spirit of wholeness, you enable us to trust that the good and that justice will prevail. You help us to cling to faith even when hope seems to run through our fingers like sand. You open the gateways of our hearts to you morning and evening that we might still sing our praise to you. Holy God, as we pour out our hearts to you, pour out your Spirit on each one of us as we gather to worship and praise you, so that your power might strengthen us in our lives, so your peace might calm any trouble in our souls, so your hope might mend any hurt in our hearts, so that we might see the way that your kingdom will come and your will be done. You are with us, living God, at this moment and always. And so we bring you our heartfelt praise, and we pray to you together in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, some people suffer more than others from earworms. I don't know if you suffer from earworms or not, but if you do, you'd certainly know what they are, even if you don't know the word. Can anyone tell me what earworms are? Does anyone know what earworms are? Yeah. Where are they? Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. It's when you've got a catchy tune that's in your head and you can't get it out of your head. It just keeps going round and round as if it's on a never-ending loop. And there was a survey recently about earworms where people said that about two-thirds of people thought it was a really good thing because your favorite tune might stick in your head and you just hear it all the time. And then about a third of people said it was a really terrible thing because it just doesn't go away when you hear a catchy tune. But maybe it's a catchy tune that might be one of your favorite tunes. I'm sure we all have our favorite tunes. Um, can you think of your own favorite tune? Would anyone like to share what their favorite tune is? Have we just sung it? <laughs> or is it a different tune? We all have our favorite tunes. We've got things that we really, we really like to hear, we like to listen to, um, and things we like to sing, whether we like to sing them um, when we're in the shower in the morning, or we like to sing them in the car, if you've got some music on in the car and everybody's singing along, or whether they just come into your head at some point and you just sing them, or you put them on, you put on a CD, or you put on Spotify or, or a bit of vinyl, and you listen to your favorite song and you sing along because you want to sing. Um, and singing along, I don't know with your favorite tune if you've ever sung it in public. Have you ever sung karaoke? Hands up if you've ever sung karaoke and want to admit it. Yeah, there's plenty of people that have sung karaoke, yes. Um, so I was looking at um, the top 20 
karaoke songs before COVID. I don't know if it's quite as popular over the last year or so, but in 2019, there was a top 20 of the most requested and the most played karaoke songs in the UK. So what I'd do is, thought I thought I'd do is show you some pictures. Sorry, Quan and Chamber Group. I might have to describe verbally. Um, show you some pictures of some famous singers and um, wonder if you could guess who they are and what their song or songs in the top 20 of karaoke might be. Okay, here goes. Um, okay, can you see? Oh, was, 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 <laughs> that was very quick. Here's the first one, <laughs> and that was the second one too. Okay, can anyone tell me who this is in a Disney parade? Yeah. It's Elsa, and what, what's her big song? Let It Go. Would you like to share a bit of Let It Go? No, you wouldn't. <laughs> well, I'm not going to have a go at it. I'll destroy it. <laughs> yeah, Elsa and Let It Go. And maybe that's your favorite song, but that was in the top 20 of what people request. Okay. And um, somebody who can see around corners in the choir. Um, oh, they can see the laptop. That's what it is. Okay, here we go. <laughs> who are those four people? Abba. Abba, yes. And what's, what song? Mamma Mia is in the top 20. Yeah, there, and there's another one actually as well. I don't know if you can guess what the other one would be. Dancing Queen. Oh, very knowledgeable people here. Some big ABBA fans, obviously. Yes. Yes. Uh, they're both in the top 20. And who are these four blokes? Um, Queen. Yes, this is the rock band Queen. Very big, obviously, in the 70s and the 80s. What's their big hit that people want to try and sing at karaoke? I don't know how they manage it. Bohemian Rhapsody, how can you sing that? And he said, oh my goodness, you'd have to do like a, a four-part harmony yourself. Mamma mia, figure magnifico. Um, that would be very difficult indeed, wouldn't it? Yes, okay. Um, here's somebody who I thought, assumed, would be in the top 20. And, and you know, for you younger guys, this is sort of slightly ancient history. So, um, but some of, some of our um, more mature people will probably know who this is. Who's this guy? Frank Sinatra. And what would you expect that people would want to have a go at in karaoke that Frank Sinatra? My way, exactly. And so it slipped out the top 20. Maybe that's, maybe that's just the passage of time. Um, my way. Well, when, I, when I read the passage we're going to look at, uh, and this sounds off, off, almost sacrilegious, but when I, when I read the passage we're going to look at from 2 Timothy, which is Paul writing to his followers, um, uh, and writing to Timothy, who'd been with him through many different adventures throughout the Mediterranean, the first thing that came to my mind was Frank Sinatra's My Way. Because in the letter, um, Paul's writing, uh, writing about um, all the things that happened in his life. He's coming towards the end of his life. He knows he is because he's in prison in Rome, and he's going to be put on trial by the Emperor Nero, and things are not going to go well. So he's writing to some of his old colleagues in the churches he's been to. And he says, almost like Frank Sinatra, um, I've lived a life that's full. I've traveled each and every highway. And he says almost, and now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. And these, this, these are the kind of words he's using. And I started thinking, this sounds like my way. Because Paul, Paul had seen so much in his 30 years of traveling throughout the Mediterranean he had been three times, he'd been all around the sea, and he'd, been, he'd faced all kinds of persecution. He'd been in jail, he'd been beaten up, he'd stones thrown at him, he'd been shunned, he'd been deserted by his followers. He'd faced all of this, and now as he was coming to the end of his life, he was looking back in it all. So, would he have been agreeing with Frank Sinatra? Would he have been singing my way along with Frank? And when I thought about it, the answer is probably no. He was 2,000 years before, but actually his story is quite different to Frank, even though those words, or quite different to the song, My Way, even though those words uh, do tell us something about what the Apostle Paul was doing. Because for Paul, it really wasn't about his way. In fact, when I was looking at it online, the song My Way was actually banned in the Philippines about 10 years ago because it was causing so much aggro. People were having fisticuffs with each other because My Way is quite a selfish song. It is saying, whatever anyone else is doing, I did it my way. I did it my way, mate. It's quite an arrogant song in some ways, and it was actually causing people um, to hit each other. Uh, but uh, the Apostle Paul wasn't saying that at all. 
Through everything that he faced, Paul was saying, this actually isn't about me. This is all about Jesus, and this is all about God, and this is all about me following him and telling people about him, despite all these terrible things that I've been facing. That's the one thing that's most important. If I'm here, I'm only here to talk about and to show people the love of God and to share God and Jesus with them. And in fact, in the letter, when he comes near the end, Paul writes, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Through all of this, I have kept the faith. And he says, God stood by me, he gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. To him be the glory forever and ever. So when Paul was coming to the end of his life, I don't think he would have been singing, it, singing I did it my way. He would have been singing, I did it his way. I did it for God, and I did it for my love of Jesus. And maybe the kind of song that he would be singing would be more like the words of the hymn that we're now going to sing together. He is Lord, He is Lord. He's risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's more of what Paul was speaking about. So let's, uh, let's sing that together now. If we're not going to sing our favorite tunes, we're not going to do karaoke, let's sing together as a hymn. Uh, we sing number 443, Tears Lord, and feel free to clout, to clap or to shout or to whistle or to sing as we go along. So our younger people go through now to Young Church with our blessing, and I uh, hope you have a very good time when you're out, guys. first reading is taken from Psalms, Psalm 65, Thanksgiving for Earth's Bounty. Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you who answer prayer, to you all flesh shall come. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those whom you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By awesome deeds you answer us with deliverance, O God of our salvation. You are the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. By your strength you establish the mountains. You are girded with might. You silence the roaring of the seas. 
the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples. Those who live at earth's furthest bounds are awed by your signs. You make the gateways of the morning and the evening shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with richness. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with green. They shout and sing together for joy. Amen.
The New Testament reading is found in 2 Timothy, reading in chapter 4, verses 6 to 8 and 16 to 18. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. From now on there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defence, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory for ever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, that was the week that was. How can you begin to describe a week of dizzying political turmoil and uncertainty, where hour by hour policies were formed and then ditched, a revolving door was set up for government ministers to spin around them, parliamentary voting in Westminster resembled a rugby scrum at Murrayfield, and at points nobody seemed to know quite what was going on. And it all ended in the resignation of our Prime Minister after only 45 days, the shortest tenure in British history. And so we now sit in limbo for the next episode to be broadcast. It's been like all the tensest of TV political dramas, like House of Cards or The West Wing, except it's been bizarrely transposed to real life. You really couldn't make it up. But the real problem might not be the confusion, the instability, the disruption and the chaos of themselves. The real problem might be the negative consequences for many people in their real everyday lives. As financial markets plummet and mortgage costs escalate, as public spending decreases and inflation increases, 
It's the immediate effect on millions of people that is so concerning. For in a seemingly wealthy first world country in the 21st century, it seems that many people will be short of enough money for food and many can no longer afford sufficient heating and lighting over the winter. What the country needs, perhaps, is not further inaction and reshuffling, but stability and trust and sure-footed decision-making, leadership in a time of crisis. The real consequences of not delivering aren't fully felt by the Downing Street cat or in the division lobby. They're felt in the lives of ordinary people and particularly the most vulnerable. Those who are already struggling and their children. Those who are unable to work through illness or injury. Those who are just getting by on a small pension. The great risk in all of this is of a deepening and continuing chasm of injustice. When God speaks of justice through the lips of the Old Testament prophets or through his son Jesus Christ, we often imagine that the kind of injustice that concerns God must be about major world events that are somewhere far away from our front doors. In this country, we've long assumed a just governance of our country on integrity and the rule of law, a system of democracy that's been honed over centuries. And so we think true injustice that God is concerned with must involve something that's far more momentous than our everyday experiences in our green and pleasant land. It must be more like the Exodus journey to freedom in the promised land out of slavery in Egypt for the people of Israel. Injustice must then occur in dictatorships, in theocracies like Iran, and where state corruption and nepotism is rife. That's surely the kind of deeply ingrained injustice that God is interested in. Or if it might be closer to home, maybe we think that injustice that is God's concern is more starkly obvious when we think of the word in legal terms, a wrongful criminal conviction or an act of discrimination against, say, minorities or refugees. But when God speaks of justice through the prophets and through Jesus Christ, God's concern for justice might well be far broader in our national life, especially in these troubling times. Jesus said, Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. What Jesus was saying in those words was shocking and confrontational. He was saying that it was God and not Caesar who would ultimately reign. That the emperor was not a god as the Romans claimed, and that Rome was not the center of a divinely sanctioned kingdom. So what kind of kingdom of God on earth does that mean? What are we actually praying for in the Lord's Prayer when we say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The New Testament scholar John Dominic Crossan says that to find out the answer, we must first ask the question, what would this world look like if Jesus did sit on Caesar's throne? Well, we know that Jesus blessed the peacemakers. He spoke of turning the other cheek. He told stories of hated Samaritans saving Jewish neighbors when they were left for dead in a ditch. And he told Peter to put down his sword in the face of the enemy. And so it cannot be the kingdom come, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, if we see a nation embroiled like Russia in the use of excessive force and violence for its own ends. That must be an injustice with which God is concerned, an offence against the kingdom of God against which we should speak up. And if Jesus sat on Caesar's throne, it surely cannot be the kingdom come, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If a country became so fixated with the workings of power that it was no longer looking after some of its own people, if it could no longer follow the words of the prophets and of Jesus to offer blessings and walk alongside the poor, the widow, 
the stranger, the child. Think of Paul's analogy of the community of God as being like a body, the weakest and most insignificant parts being as important as all the others. Think of Gandhi's words, the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. And if a country were no longer to hear the calls of those people, and if there were an absence of decisive action to address them, no matter our political persuasion, that must also be an injustice in God's eyes, perhaps much closer to home, against which we also ought to speak up. Indeed, if we were to do so, Jesus said in the words of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Well, where does that leave us when we turn the pages of Scripture and see the passages of the lectionary for today? We read together the words of the Apostle Paul writing to his follower, his protege Timothy from house arrest in Rome as he awaited a show trial with an inevitable outcome the injustice of an execution at the hands of imperial Roman power. We have thoughts from Paul's words that might speak to us in our present day dilemmas. Thoughts of perseverance in the face of challenge. Paul's thoughts of trust and faith in God throughout it all and of his confidence that God's justice will ultimately prevail. Transported as a prisoner from Jerusalem, Paul would likely have faced the first defense that he talks of in this passage right there in the hall of the Roman governor of Judea at Caesarea Maritima on the Mediterranean coast before he was carted off in chains to Rome. And in the might of imperial Rome itself, in the spring of AD 60, Paul was waiting trial before Nero. He was effectively on death row if we're talking a blatant injustice from a wrongful imprisonment, this is it. And as he awaited trial, he and his followers wrote a series of letters that now form part of our New Testament canon, including this one to Timothy. We might call them part last will and testament, part memoir, part famous last words. But not for him the drama of the Kiss Me Hardy of Nelson, or anything jocular like the words Spike Milligan chose for his gravestone, I told you I was ill. Instead, looking back, Paul expressed words of deep gravity. He shared what the past 30 years had meant for him since his dramatic conversion on the Damascus Road. And so on the one hand, it's a letter to Timothy that is very intimate and personal. And yet it's also underpinned by words expressing a fervent faith and trust in God, a confidence and a hope in Jesus Christ, a calm surety that belies his circumstances, that stands in contrast to the great turbulence of the whole of his life. For if we think this week of our national life has been one of turmoil, here was the life of a man who'd been beaten up and stoned, who'd been chased out of town and jailed, who'd been shunned and abandoned by his own colleagues and supporters. As he says here of his first trial in Caesarea Maritima, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. And yet still those famous words are written. As the hour of his departure from this life approaches, Paul writes, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. A strength of trust underneath in God's ultimate deliverance, despite the chaos of the world all around him. An unshakable belief in the promises and hope of the resurrected Christ. This is a man whose life and faith are rooted in the kind of stability and security that we yearn for right now. With such single-minded determination and focus, such leadership and clarity of vision that would be welcome in the coming days too. But more in this short passage. At the end of his life, Paul was living out 
the threefold response to God in awe and in praise of the psalmist in Psalm 65. God as the source of forgiveness. Paul said, let not the desertion of my friends count against them. God as the deliverer from hardship. Paul said, the Lord stood by me. He gave me the strength still to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. And God as the provider. He will save me for the harvest of his heavenly kingdom. And not just me, said Paul, as some kind of super Christian. But verse 8, for all who have longed for the presence of Jesus. This is Paul's inspirational memoir at the last not only of being steadfast and sure while the billows roll but being joyous in persevering feeling God's presence in the middle of all his turmoil and yet still self-giving describing himself being poured out as a renewing and refreshing drink to others and beyond him keeping the faith when many would have walked away from God Is there a word here too on justice in this one of his last great messages? Verse 8, on the day of his passing, Paul says, There is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me. The Greek word here translated as righteousness and righteous can also be translated as justice and just. Perhaps that might be a truer reading given the blatantly unjust circumstances that Paul found himself in. Verse 8 would then read, There is reserved for me the crown of justice, which the Lord, the just judge, will give me. Despite his earthly betrayal and the injustice of it all, Paul kept his faith at the finish of the race by grounding his hope in the ultimate mercy and the justice of God the judge of all humankind. Injustices on this earth, offences towards the kingdom of God, a kingdom brought to earth in Jesus Christ of love, of peace, of fairness and equality, forgiveness and mercy. Such injustices may not be righted before our eyes. For our nation this week, as another episode in the drama at the top unfolds, Let us pray that the new Prime Minister now acts swiftly and decisively to address the growing stresses and suffering in the country, that justice will indeed prevail. But we hold fast as well to Paul's steadfast belief for then and now that the sometime turmoil and chaos of our lives, political or personal, will ultimately be quelled if, like Paul, we keep the faith and trust in the promises of God. And we are reassured too that the words of the prophets and of Jesus Christ will indeed one day be a living reality, that the kingdom of God is truly near, where wrongs will ultimately be righted and all things will forever be made new. Amen.
Let us pray. At a time like this, Lord, when chaos and confusion reigns in our national life, when people around us face a struggle to keep fed and warm over winter, when war in Ukraine seems endless, when hunger stalks the Horn of Africa, it makes us want to turn away, to put our fingers in our ears as sometimes we feel as if we can hear it no more. But you call us back, Lord, into the reality of this world in all its joy and all its brokenness. And you whisper to us once again, like the prophet Micah, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you all the days of our lives. And so no matter the barriers that face all of us in the race of life, we choose to keep the faith, to fight the good fight. We commit to hope, to trust in you, Lord God, to your promise of justice and of resurrection in this life and the next. In the closed rooms where power brokers meet at this moment to decide our next national leader, we pray that the voices of the most vulnerable might be heard too, and that justice will prevail. In the situation rooms where the masters of war calculate the next offensive, the next attacks, and count the mounting toll, holding thousands of human lives in the balance, we pray for a just peace and for reconciliation. In the forgotten corners of the globe where the hungry and the thirsty daily strive to survive, we pray for fairness and for food. The kingdom of God is at hand. You proclaimed it through your Son, Jesus Christ. But sometimes it feels more far away. You demonstrated its grace and showed its power but the signs often seem faded in our world. We pray, Lord, for your kingdom to be revealed in this world, turning our war and divisions, our political maneuvering and self-interest into peace and collaboration, into integrity and trust. May your kingdom come to us now because your kingdom, Lord, is so different, challenging the ways of human beings. We pray for the powerful and the influential ones, those who lead countries or communities, and especially for our new Prime Minister this week. Because your love, Lord God, is so indiscriminate, crossing boundaries and meeting everyone, we pray for the lost and the lonely ones, we pray for those who are separated from loved ones by distance or by their passing. Because your presence, Holy Spirit, is so constant, never abandoning or neglecting us, we pray now in a time of silence for those people and those situations that are closest to our hearts. We pray, Lord, because we believe that no one is beyond your grace, and we believe that the prayers we offer to you enable us also to receive and to share the blessings you desire to give us. Your kingdom, Lord, is near, and it is coming. Make us faithful to its message and humble agents of its ways. In Jesus' name, amen.
we say together our closing responses. In darkness and in light, in trouble and in joy, help us, Creator God, to trust your love, to seek your kingdom, and to praise your name. Send us out to go in peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with each one of us and with everyone whom we love, now and always.